I was expecting to be welcomed with a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. We're talking about happiness, right? Can I have the clicker? Yeah? That's not coming. Where was it? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sister. Brother and sister, Assalamu alaikum. It's a pleasure to be with all of you, to be a part of this illustrious panel and speaking to all you amazing people. Uh, in fact, after seeing Dr. No's presentation, my PPD didn't want to reveal itself. You know, it was so embarrassed. Uh, what I, in fact, when Alexander, Mr. Alexander sent me the flyer of the program, what really struck me was the objective. It said, to make Dubai the happiest city on earth. And I said, oh my God, now that's one lofty goal. That's one amazing goal. And as we all say, the quality of a person is known by the quality of his goals. And I said, wow, now that's something worth fighting for, to be the happiest city on earth. That's something worth striving for. But I think uh, happiness is a concept that's been grossly misunderstood. I was speaking to the deputy CEO of an organization, okay? And he told me, Ibrahim, wallah, we wasted a lot of money on happiness and we didn't get anything. So I asked him, sir, what did you do? He said, well, we served ice cream, we served coffee, we conducted gatherings, but my turnover didn't go down, my revenue didn't go up. At the end, we just took people away from productive work. Now, this gentleman was a CFO before he became a deputy CEO. So he was talking a lot about costs. And I told him, sir, because you focused on the wrong things, because happiness is not just about positive emotions, the emotion that you have when you have ice cream, but you could have done a lot of other things. He told me, enlighten me, tell me. I said, well, you could have made work so engaging, aligned with each person's strengths and each person's talents, that he'll get engrossed in his work, he'll get lost, and, and he wouldn't want to go back home in the evening. He said, really? I said, yeah, really. You could have built relationships at work, trust and camaraderie and support, that people would say, I don't want to go home for the weekend, I want to sit here and work. You could have work, made work meaningful. How do you make work meaningful? When you connect people with the impact that their work has on customers. This is the difference that I made, the insignificant me, and this is what I, my, my insignificant work led to. People start worshipping work, you know, work attains a spiritual aura, and they say, oh my God, I'm, I'm going to stay loyal to the organization. And of course, accomplishments. It's, it's amazing. When you get people to do things, and when you, get people to when you get people to achieve things, that's when they realize, who did this? I did this? Oh my God, I never knew that I could do this. And each time you get that feeling that I've done something significant, that's when you start feeling good about yourself and you start feeling good about the organization. So I told him, these are all smart ways where you can get people to work more and still be happy. I said, where were you? <laughs> so it's not just about ice creams and, and coffee. So the happiest city on earth. Ladies and gentlemen, I just want to focus on one particular aspect. As, a, as, a, as, a, as somebody who wants to champion learning, I would say that learning is related to all these. But today, for the next 25 minutes or so, let me focus on the achievement bit. And let me argue that when you learn more, you achieve more. And when you achieve more, you become happy. I remember when I used to go home with a, with a sort of dismal mark sheet and stand crestfallen before my father, who was a professor at a college. He used to look at me and say, Ibrahim, there's much more to you than this. There's much more to you than this. And I think the script writer of Troy got it from him where a man stands at the beaches of Troy and say, glory there, immortality, it's yours, go take it. So he used to say, Ibrahim, your full potential, it's over there. Go, learn and take it. So this is what I would like to argue. If we can get not just professionals like us, but students, unskilled workers, so many of them we see on the streets as we drive by, the unemployed, the soon to be unemployed. I know that sounds scary. Yeah, we'll talk about that uh, uh, in a, a bit. The soon to be unemployed, housewives, retired folk, all these segments. If we can tell them there's much more to you than this, you can do much more, you can be much more productive, provided you learn. And thereby, if we can make Dubai a smart learning city, 
where lifelong learning is a reality, where you learn from the cradle to the grave, you can make Dubai the happiest city on earth. So this is what I'd, I'll try to argue in the next 25 minutes. Game? Yeah? Good. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, before I go ahead, I would like to do a check our attitude towards learning. So can I get honest answers? Two simple questions. Yeah? Okay. The first question is, the words that you associate with learning are, A, exciting, useful, interesting, something that I love to do, or B, boring, useless, forced to do, or stressful. How many of you would say A? Can I see a show of hands? Really? Well, <laughs> great, amazing. Okay, I'm, I'm in the right crowd. Yeah, the second question is, if the definition of learner is someone who is continuously motivated to acquire new skills. What did I learn today? What did I, what skill did I acquire today? Okay? What did I get better at today? Knowledge or behavior. I would call myself, or you would call yourself, a super learner? A learner or not quite a learner? How many of you would call yourself a super learner? A, can I see a show of hands? That's 20% of the room. Learner? That's a majority. And not quite a learner. Very few. MashaAllah. Great. Okay. Now, I'll come back to these questions in a while. Let me tell you, uh, it was exactly last week. I was invited to speak at a, at a conference for bankers. Okay. So, I walked in. I was a speaker. And there was this gentleman, very senior banker, who looked at me and said, Ibrahim, I heard that your bank is merging with some other bank. Okay. Immediately while I was speaking to him, I was, I was talking about assets and liabilities and, and all that. But you know what was happening deep inside? The first question I had, subhanAllah, who is the head of learning and development of that bank? You know why? Because though we talk about mergers and acquisitions, it's usually acquisitions, right? So when I got my first break, I went and, and I searched LinkedIn. Who is the head of L&D of that bank? Is he better than me? Does he know anything more than me? And I found that he was bilingual. And I was thinking, oh my God, I had all this time to learn Arabic. I didn't do that. How can I learn it now? You know, if something untoward happens in the next probably couple of months' time. And he, and he had this certification better than me. He had this significant experience. So I think this is a question, brothers and sisters, a very uncomfortable question we need to ask ourselves. What happens if our job ceases to exist? I'm not talking about future employability here. I'm talking about current employability within the next two months or so. What happens if it just vanishes? What do you do? Of course, you get onto the job market, right? You look for future uh, better opportunities. But when you start looking for those opportunities, there's a question that you need to ask. That particular job, am I competitive enough to get that? Those jobs have certain critical success factors. Are those critical success factors my strengths or are those my weaknesses? So just imagine these are the questions that we need to constantly ask. Where do I stand, Ibrahim? Where do you stand? What do I have to learn? What are my resources? What can I learn at my pace with my budget? In my style? Do I have any mentors who can help me with this? Is there a learning group that I can join? What if someone can help me with this? What if there's someone here who can help you with this? Ibrahim Tal, come. This is where you stand. This is what you have to do to remain employable. And these are your resources. Here are some mentors that you can use. There are some learning clubs that you can join. Amazing, right? I'm sure that will lead to better happiness. So the question that I would like to park in your minds for some time is, what if someone can help us all with this? What if someone can help us all with this? I came back to the office and a good friend of mine had emailed me this report. How many of you have read this report, The Future of Jobs in the Middle East, from McKinsey and Company? This was published as part of the World Government Communication Forum, I believe. How many of you have read this? Can I see your show of hands? Oh, really scary, okay? <laughs> the Future of Jobs in the Middle East. And usually when people talk about the future, I, I'm not very, uh, you know, I don't get ruffled a, a lot. How many of you have seen the, the movie uh, Back to the Future? Amazing. Which year are they talking about? 2015. And we still don't have flying 
uh, uh, skateboards, right? So I'm saying, yeah, it's okay. A lot of people in the office are very skeptical. They're saying, subhanAllah, there is some software there which is looking at my office, learning and development head. I want to get there in a couple of years' time. I think that's a bit of an overstatement, yeah? But you know what this report told me when I read it? It said, this is the scary part. In the six Middle East countries, 45% of existing work activities are automatable today. We're not talking about 2030 here. If organizations decide to embrace technology that's existing today, 45% of jobs could vanish. We're talking about the next few years, not 2030. And then I said, oh no, we're talking about routine jobs here. We're talking about routine process-based jobs here. We're not talking about critical, innovative jobs. And, and the report said, oh yeah, even those kind of jobs, we're talking about 29 to 37%. So you know what I did? I went and looked at it industry-wise. How many of you from the academia here, teachers, university, we should be happy. You know why, ma'am? I looked at this report, and the first thing that I looked at is finance, because I'm a banker. And finance, it said, okay, the chances of automation today, not 30 years from now, we're talking about 45%. But education is way down. <laughs> so I said, I've got some time. I've got some time, so I can catch up. But then we're not talking about losing jobs completely. I know that's not practical. But then these are the kind of jobs that are going to exist in the future. We'll have trainers. We'll have explainers. We'll have sustainers. Do we all know what these jobs are about? Do we know how we have to upskill ourselves, retrain ourselves today so that we can take these positions up in the future? Because we'll be extensively working with machines. And look at the narratives that you've had, the stories that you've told. The, the conversations that you've had with friends in the last couple of months, how many of these words have you been using regularly? Like, for example, advanced robotics and 3D printing, as if you know, as if it's the back of your hand, have you been doing that? If not, I think we should, because we're talking about the immediate future. Clear and present danger. It was a movie, I think, from Harrison Ford. Clear and present danger. And, and this is the language that we need to speak. And I'm talking about future employability, but not very long-term future employability. Because long-term plans usually are not as scary as they are when you reach there. As an economist said, in the long term, we all will be dead anyway. Yeah? But we're talking about future employability as in one to two years' time. So my question again, what if someone can today retrain our workers? What if someone can prepare our young students for this revolution? What if someone can drive policy and, and, and reinvent early education? Let me park that question again. Brothers and sisters, uh, when I joined my bank, that was in 2007, a uh, couple of, I think three months after I joined, a CEO called me and said, Ibrahim, what have you been doing? Okay, tell me what have you been doing? And I said, you know, I said, department is doing phenomenally well, our customer service department is doing really well, our mystery shopper scores are 95%. He said, Ibrahim, even if I fire you today, or even if I take your entire department off today, these departments will continue doing well. And that's not where, where I want you to focus on. And he said, every year after performance appraisal, 35 to 40 of our associates are marked as underperformers. They get a score of two in the performance appraisal. In a lot of other organizations, if you get a two, that's basically one step away from the door, right? We are not very patient when it comes to underperformance. So he said, what I want you to do is adopt them because your success as a training or a learning organization is in upskilling them. And th these are exactly the words he said. It's a shame if we can't get these people to perform. So when a plan doesn't perform, you don't throw it out of the balcony, right? You pour some water, change the position, add some manure, and this is exactly what you should do. And that was the objective given to us. We started working on it, and as a learning and development specialist, I understand it's very seldom about the person. There's a performance ecosystem. It's the manager, the climate, the products, the, the whole ambience, the culture, and all that leads to, to, to performance, superior performance or poor performance. So we started working on it. This was selected as a best practice by the Department of Economic Development, Government of Dubai in 2011. Yeah, and what we did is every year, alhamdulillah, on an average, 85 to 86% of these associates are upgraded within a six-month period. I know that's happening in our organization, but I 
know for certain that it's not happening in so many other organizations. You perform poorly, you are on the carpet. Not on the red carpet where you're welcomed with, with pomp and splendor, but the carpet that leads to the exit door. So my question is, what if someone can help these underperformers out there? How much of happiness can we bring into Dubai if we can do that? If we can really work with these people and upgrade them? One more story. I won't bore you much about, with stories about my organization. When we first applied for the Dubai Quality Award, again from DED, the model talked about empowerment. Okay? And as an assessor for the Dubai Quality Award, the first thing when I talk about empowerment is, oh, we've got a delegation matrix. Okay, people are given these authorities when they get ahead. And that's when our management said, come on, Sangeet, this is just for the sake of writing. Because in a bank, you really don't have empowerment. You have policies and procedures and the central bank breathing over your shoulder, the Sharia department. You're not really empowered. So let, when, when we talk about empowerment, let me really, let's really do empower people. So what we did is, we had at that time, I think, 16 office boys. Guys who would come in and serve you tea and coffee. Now, some of them were graduates. Many of them were not. We said, let's put a plan where in a year's time, we absorb them into the workforce. How do you absorb them into the workforce? We first did a, a, a performance audit. Then we did a learning audit. We got them to attend courses. We arranged mentors for them, taught them the English language, a lot of informal learning strategies in place. Within one and a half to two years, every single person was absorbed into the workforce. So this boy who used to come in with a white sort of, uh, you know, soiled shirt and stand in a, in a very submissive posture, today wears a jacket and stands next to us proudly because he's now part of the workforce. Yeah, some of them still maintain that submissive posture when they see senior managers. And I tell them, no, 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 come on. We are all on the same side of the table. So my question is, when you drive in, you see a lot of people, right? And these are people who are excluded from the happiness story. Why? Because they're not graduates. They never had an opportunity to learn. We've got universities here. Why can't we look at retraining them? Why can't we? We can have MOOCs in every language. We can have, uh, we have technology with us. We're talking about amazing things. But I think what Dr. Aisha said in her last slide, the why matters. And when it comes to happiness, we're talking about happiness of people. Because everything that we plan to do as part of our strategy finally boils down to how happy you are. And how can we make these people who have been excluded happy? So the question is, what if someone can assist and guide the excluded? My final point is, when I asked you this question, brothers and sisters, how many of you associate learning with good things? 70% of you said yes. My wife and I, we run a social organization where we train children, children who are not doing very well, okay? And recently, we asked the same question to 800-odd students studying in different schools. What percentage of students do you think said, I associate good things with learning? Can you, give, can you, give, can you just guess out? Pardon me? We use the word... What words would you associate with the word learning? Would you say learning is, is, is exciting? Would you say learning is useful? And unfortunately, less than 10% of students agreed with us. They said learning is boring, learning is forced upon us, learning is useless. So you're all guys of outgrown learning. Congrats. <laughs> we're all guys of outgrown schools because we know I'm an educator myself. And I think we need to blame us as teachers because the, the mode that we are right in there, a stage, a sage on stage, and, and people sitting down uh, stiff and, and trying to imbibe stuff, that's the worst way to learn. Yeah? And I think we are failing there. It was two years back where we were invited for a group counseling session. There was a young girl of 15. And this smart young girl had committed suicide because she was not able to bear the pressure uh, which was exerted from school and by parents. So she jumped from the 20th floor or so, and she committed suicide. And, and the rest of the parents and students in the building, they were sort of very worried. So we were called in to do a group counseling session. And we started speaking to students. And you know what schools do today, even today? We use our grading systems to tell us that you're not doing well, and you'll, not continue, you'll, 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 you'll always continue to do, to do poorly. 
teachers come and say, oh, I've got 32 10 CGPAs in our school. And we ask them this question, have they always been performing well, sir? Oh, yes. What about those who have not been performing well? They've always been like that. So what are we really doing to find these students who are not performing well and telling them that you can? There's much more to you than this. Giving them strategies where they would love learning, assisting them, supporting them, building confidence, teaching them learning strategies so that you can upgrade them. And not talk about 10 or 20, 10 CGPAs, but much more, because we all can do that. So this is my final question. What if someone can guide our students? What if someone can upgrade our teachers to become learning counselors? Let me bring all those questions back into the forum. What if someone can assist us in employability so that we are happy? Assist us in future employability so that we are happy? Assist the excluded, assist the underperformers, assist the students, and assist all those segments. What if someone can do that? And today I propose to you that what if that someone could be Dubai? Because the question why is very pertinent. And if we want to make people happy, we have to let them perform better, achieve more things. And they do that by learning things better. So just imagine, this is a grand vision where Dubai is the smart learning city. SubhanAllah, where government, universities, corporates and social organizations, we are working together to allow every single person national and resident, from the cradle to the grave, learn and realize his full potential. Because there's much more to us than this. Just imagine hoardings while you're driving on Sheikh Zayed Road, a hoarding that says, learning is fun. Probably we'll get George Clooney to do that. Learning is fun. Learn. What did you learn today? Are you realizing your full potential? Just imagine again, I talk about MOOCs. Abu Dhabi University offering MOOCs in different languages where any can open up. I was so happy when I saw the slide about the smart university where you have unstructured uh, informal learning that's possible. Learning audits. At any point in time you can open an app from government of Dubai and you can do a learning audit. Where am I? Where do I have to be? What do I have to learn? Who are my mentors? Who are my learning groups? Umpty knowledge sharing forums. Mentors available online where people can converse with. Learning clubs. Different topics. Qualifications were experiential learner. Oh, I was cutting grass for, for, for 15 years. But I've got this experience in, 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 in doing different things, and I'm not a graduate. Come, learn with us. We'll qualify you so that you can get ahead. And we can paint a smiley on your face, because the why is important. Conferences on every topic under the sun. This is my, my, my greatest vision, subhanAllah. Where, like, a, like a shopping festival, Every year we have got a Dubai Learning Festival. Imagine you're driving on, on the Emirates Road and you see a Dubai Learning Festival happening every year. And what do you have? You've got stalls where you've got companies driving technology, companies driving courses and, and universities coming and having stalls. Spot learning, learning audits. You've got kiosks where you can click some buttons and know what you have to learn to perform better today, perform better in the future. Great talks. TED Talks like formats where you, you've got amazing speakers coming in and, 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 and inspiring people to learn. Rewards galore for the best learner, best investors in people, best mentors, best learning clubs. And then you've got raffle draws. And you win a raffle draw, you don't win a car, but instead you get an opportunity to learn at Abu Dhabi University for two years, free of charge. Or you get a qualification. And subhanAllah, when we're all there amidst Pomp and splinter, lights, having fun, learning, getting inspired to learn, you hear the sound of fireworks. And the night sky lights up. And the fireworks will spell this out, these words. There's more to us than this. There's more to every one of us than this. Let's use technology, let's use the grand vision, and let's use all these amazing stakeholders together to help people learn better, perform better, and eventually be more happy. Thank you.